This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 81, Stephen Meek II. When two-year-old Stephen Meek II was taken to a Virginia hospital, unresponsive, and died two days later, Investigators focused on his mother's boyfriend, Mackenzie Hellman, whose story about how Stephen incurred his injuries didn't add up. No one could have anticipated just how horrific Mackenzie's actions truly were, or how fundamentally baby Stephen had been betrayed by his own mother, Kayla Thomas. Only when the two were charged with multiple crimes involving sexual abuse and child pornography did the full picture of the couple's depravity begin to develop. This is the story of a sweet, well-behaved little boy who adored Mickey Mouse and loved learning new things. It's also the story of a mother who allowed the twisted desires of her morally bankrupt boyfriend to eclipse the responsibilities of motherhood to a degree most of us will never comprehend. This is the stomach-turning story of Stephen Meek II. One quick patron shout-out this week. Thank you so much to my newest patron, Jackie K. from Narnia, If you'd like to support the show and help me keep the weekly episodes coming, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. I truly appreciate the support. Before I get into the story today, please have a listen to this promo for another excellent true crime podcast, Tapes from the Dark Side. 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 Is an awesome new true crime podcast. What motive could a father have for hurting his own son? What dark secret is Mark Redwine hiding? In season one, the host TZ Borden investigates the curious case of a missing 13-year-old boy and the father suspected of murder. Please go search Tapes from the Dark Side on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tapes from the Dark Side. You should give it a good listen. Find Tapes from the Dark Side wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, I want to warn you up front. Baby Stevens is among the most disturbing, horrific stories I've ever covered. By the end of this episode, you and I will both be wishing that most of the details I've reported were made up, but everything I'm about to tell you really happened to this tiny, innocent two-year-old boy who did nothing to deserve the horrors committed against him by his own mother and her boyfriend. Strap in. This is going to be a tough one. After several false starts and 28 hours of true labor, At 4.38 a.m. on July 14, 2016, Kayla Nicole Thomas and Stephen Dale Meek Sr. of Montgomery County, Virginia, welcomed their first and only child together. Stephen Dale Meek II was born weighing 7 pounds 6 ounces, and he was 20.5 inches in length. All indications point to Stephen being a healthy, happy little boy who experienced no shortage of love from his family, even after his parents separated. Kayla and Stephen shared custody of their blonde, blue-eyed son after their breakup, and Stephen soon became close with his new stepmom, Michelle, even calling the woman Mama. After she and Stephen Sr. broke up, Kayla began dating an enormous, beastly lug with a shaved head, a patchy mustache, and a hideous chin-strap beard named Mackenzie Hellman. A number of episodes back, I compared a particular convicted child killer, Gary Fellenbaum, to an extra from The Hills Have Eyes. Let's just say he and Mackenzie could be brothers. I'll include Mackenzie's revolting mugshot in the Facebook photo album for today's episode. In a weird twist, Stephen Meek Sr. and Mackenzie Hellman each have children with the same two women. I spent several hours untangling these complicated relationships, so bear with me for a second while I lay it all out. 
In 2015, Mackenzie began dating Cheyenne Bean, who had a three-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. The pair was engaged within a month or so, although Mackenzie said at the time that they'd known each other for 10 years by that point. By late 2015, Cheyenne was pregnant with Mackenzie's son, who I'll call E.H., and who was born in March of 2016. Mackenzie and Cheyenne were married in an impromptu ceremony on April 4, 2017, but they separated within weeks. Cheyenne later wrote of her former husband, who she says was abusive, See, my problem is I married into a good family, just not so much a good spouse. By July of 2017, Cheyenne was dating Stephen Meek Sr. During their relationship, she became pregnant with the couple's son, J.M., who was born several weeks premature in April of 2018 and later diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Stephen Sr. and Cheyenne were off and on for several months throughout 2018. Shortly after they broke up, Stephen Sr. married Michelle, the woman his son took to calling Mama. Meanwhile, Mackenzie began dating Kayla Thomas, with whom Stephen already had a son, and by early 2019, Kayla was pregnant with Mackenzie's son as well. Clear as mud? Now, things are about to get extremely dark. Around 9 p.m. on Friday, January 11, 2019, a 911 call summoned first responders to 430 Zinc Lane in Christiansburg, Virginia, which is the county seat of Montgomery County. The caller, 25-year-old Mackenzie Hellman, requested medical assistance for his girlfriend's two-year-old son, Stephen Meek, who, the caller said, was unresponsive after a fall. When police and EMTs arrived at the home, located in a neighborhood of trailer homes, they found Mackenzie sitting on the living room floor next to the lifeless body of a tiny blonde boy. Mackenzie's girlfriend and Stephen's mother, Kayla Thomas, was at work. Rescue personnel performed CPR on Stephen for nearly 25 minutes before they finally got a pulse, at which point he was taken by ambulance to Lewis Gale Hospital, Montgomery. Later, Stephen was airlifted to Roanoke Memorial Hospital and placed on life support. Medical staff noted injuries that did not appear consistent with Mackenzie's account of the incident, which was that Stephen had fallen off his bed. Investigators determined that the bed in question was Stephen's toddler bed and that the tallest height from which he could have fallen was 13 inches. The floor beneath the bed was carpeted and padded with a playmat. There was no way the injuries the baby sustained could have been caused by such a fall. Police launched a criminal investigation. On Sunday, January 13th, Authorities arrested Mackenzie Kyle Hellman and charged him with one count of felony child abuse. He was held without bond at the Montgomery County Jail and later transferred to Western Virginia Regional Jail. Tests showed that baby Stephen had only minimal brain activity, but his family hoped and prayed as he remained unresponsive on life support all weekend. Ultimately, at 7.40 p.m. on January 13, 2019, two-year-old Stephen Dale Meek II died from his injuries. The investigation into Stephen's death revealed a history of physical and sexual abuse, allegedly at the hands of not only his mother's boyfriend, but his mother herself. On Wednesday, January 16th, Christiansburg police arrested Stephen's mother, 25-year-old Kayla Nicole Thomas, on multiple shocking charges, which included committing forcible sodomy by engaging in fellatio against the victim's will by force, threat, or intimidation, inanimate object penetration of a person less than 13 years of age, production of child pornography involving a child less than 15 years of age, possession and distribution of child pornography, and, being a parent or guardian, committing a willful act so gross and wanton as to show a reckless disregard for human life, child neglect. Kayla, who was again pregnant at the time with Mackenzie's child, was also locked up at Western Virginia Regional Jail and held without bond. She had the absolute gall to face a judge the following day and ask, in tears, if she could be released from jail to attend her son's funeral. The judge told the crying woman in an orange jail jumpsuit that he could not make that decision until she had a bond hearing. The day after Kayla's arrest, on Thursday, January 17th, Mackenzie Hellman's charges were steeply upgraded to include murder while committing another felony, in this case child abuse, felony child abuse, two counts of aggravated sexual battery of a child less than 13 years old, solicitation of a minor less than 15 years old for sexual purposes, accessory to inanimate object sexual penetration with a child less than 13 years old, accessory to forcible sodomy by engaging in fellatio with a child less than 13 years old, possession of child pornography, accessory before the fact to production of child pornography, and accessory before the fact to distribution of child pornography. 
According to police, Stephen was murdered, and his death was caused by brutal blunt force trauma to the head. At a press conference on the morning of Friday, January 18th, Christiansburg Police Chief Mark Sisson addressed a room full of reporters, saying, uh, It is with a sense of profound sadness that I stand before you today. As you're already aware, on Friday, January the 11th at approximately 9.15 p.m., the Christiansburg Police Department and Christiansburg Rescue responded to a call reporting an unresponsive child who had fallen at a residence at 430 Zinc Lane in the town of Christiansburg. The child who we can now identify as Stephen Dale Meek II, age two, ultimately died from the injuries he sustained. The incident resulted in a very detailed and thorough investigation of the events leading up to the death of Stephen Meek. We are now in a position to provide information about what we have discovered. A criminal investigation was initiated and our detectives worked around the clock, conducting interviews, executing search warrants, and collecting evidence. This investigation revealed evidence indicating that Stephen had been the victim of physical, physical abuse, and as a result, on Sunday, January the 11th, Mackenzie Hellman was arrested and charged with one count of felony child abuse. Our detectives continued with their investigation in the cause of Stephen's death and ultimately uncovered evidence indicating that Stephen was not only the victim of physical abuse that resulted in his injuries on January the 11th, but also that he had been the victim of sexual abuse at the hands of both Mackenzie Hellman and his mother, Kayla Thomas. Preliminary forensics evidence indicates that Stephen died as a result of extreme blunt force trauma to the head. The number and severity of injuries indicate that the injuries were not the result of one impact from a fall, as we were initially told by Mackenzie Hellman. Instead, the evidence indicates multiple injuries to the head and body area. Additionally, evidence uncovered during the investigation impl implemented both Hellman and Kayla Thomas in the ongoing sexual abuse of this child. As a result of these findings, on Thursday, January the 17th, Mackenzie Hellman was charged and also Kayla Thomas. And you uh, have been provided those charges. I will not read through those. The one thing I will elaborate on quickly uh, is the felony murder charge. Uh, there will be a lot of questions about that. Uh, felony murder described is when the victim accidentally dies during the commission of another felony. The other felony in this case is child abuse. With regards to this charge, the investigation is continuing and it's likely that this charge will be upgraded as we work this case with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. We are very fortunate in this community where violent crime is rare. The same good fortune makes it all the, all the more shocking when events like this happen within our community. What happened to this innocent child can only be described as horrific, and we can only imagine the pain felt by the loved ones of Stephen Meeks, and our hearts and prayers go out to the families involved. At this time, I'll ask uh, if you have questions, I'll try to answer the ones that I can. Were there any other victims that you know about involved in this case, in this situation, related to the charges that have been brought forward? Yes. Can you tell us how many? Uh, just one other. A minor. Does Kayla Thomas have any other children? Uh, no. Do you know she is pregnant at this time? Yeah. Yes, she is. So you said Thomas doesn't have another child, but Helen does? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Do you know if anyone else was in the home the night of Friday? Sorry if you already said that. Uh, we don't believe so. I don't have information that there was others in the home. There, there was another child present, but not another adult. Stephen's funeral was held on Saturday, January 19, 2019, at the Bauer Funeral Home Chapel. Baby Stephen was cremated, and at least part of his remains were given to his grandparents, Melinda and C.J. Chrisley. They created a memorial display dedicated to Stephen and their dog, Lucy Lou, who died in July of 2018. Stephen adored his grandparents' big, beautiful gray dog, who he called Woozy Woo. An autopsy was conducted, but the report would not be available until May, so prosecutors asked the judge to continue Mackenzie's preliminary hearing. Kayla waived her right to a preliminary hearing, and her five felony charges were sent to a grand jury. At a hearing in May of 2019, Mackenzie's attorney, Fred Kellerman, requested an evaluation be conducted of his client's sanity at the time of the offense and his competency to stand trial, stating that Mackenzie had been involuntarily committed several times to mental health facilities. 
The evaluation was completed in September of 2019, and the following month, he was found competent to stand trial. On the afternoon of December 20, 2019, a pretrial hearing took place for McKenzie, at which the state filed a motion to drop some of the charges against him, including two counts of aggravated sexual battery, solicitation of a minor, and forcible sodomy as an accessory. The dismissal of these charges left him with a total of six charges, which included felony murder, felony child abuse or neglect, accessory before the fact to production of child pornography, accessory before the fact to distribution of child pornography, accessory to inanimate object sexual penetration with a child less than 13 years old, and possession of child pornography. Multiple witnesses testified at the pretrial hearing, providing as yet unheard details that were both shocking and sickening. First, prosecutors played the seven-minute 911 call McKenzie made at 9.13 p.m. on January 11, 2019. During the call, McKenzie told the dispatcher that his girlfriend's son fell while jumping on his bed and became unresponsive, although, he said, the boy, who had a mark on his forehead, was still breathing. Before McKenzie hung up after first responders arrived, he told the dispatcher, I'm so scared. His mom is at work. And I'm going to be sick. The first witness to testify at the hearing was Officer Timothy Lusk, who was the first responder to the 911 call. Officer Lusk said that according to McKenzie, his son and his girlfriend's son, both two years old, had been playing in a bedroom when McKenzie heard a loud thump and found Stephen unresponsive on the floor. According to Officer Lusk, Stephen was partially dressed and both of his eyes were bruised. He began CPR on the little boy before EMTs arrived and took over. Next on the stand was police investigator Nathan Delp, who arrived on scene at 10.10 p.m. the evening of Stephen's fatal injury. Investigator Delp testified that McKenzie told him the two boys were playing matchbox cars in the bedroom when Stephen was injured, at which point he carried the boy into the living room. McKenzie told investigator Delp that he called Kayla before dialing 911, which was verified through phone records. He called Kayla at 9.05 and 911 at 9.13. Investigator Delp also testified about texts that were exchanged between Kayla and McKenzie just before 9 p.m., in which Kayla asked McKenzie why Stephen was the way he was, saying, I know it's not all my fault. McKenzie's response was to text, You need to stop worrying about his stupid ass. The investigator also testified about photos and messages found on the couple's phones. The prosecution presented into evidence a photo found on McKenzie's phone of a woman's hand holding an object that was being used to penetrate a toddler in a sexual manner. Investigator Delp said he questioned McKenzie about the photo, and McKenzie confirmed the child was Stephen and the woman's hand in the picture belonged to Kayla Thomas. He said he was not in the room at the time and did not take the photo, but he admitted that he asked Kayla to take it and send it to him because he wanted to see how the baby's abuse would affect him, and to explore the extent of his sexual needs. He told the investigator that when the photo was taken, Kayla and Stephen were in the master bedroom of the trailer home, while he was masturbating in their roommate's bedroom at the other end of the home. The investigator also testified about a screenshot found on Kayla's phone, depicting several messages from Mackenzie to Kayla, in which Mackenzie asked her to take several videos of herself performing several specific sexual acts on her son. The messages requested 30-second videos of Kayla abusing Stephen, including a request for her to take the object in the photo and poke him with it. Mackenzie's final message in the screenshot stated that if Kayla abused her son in this way, I should be able to touch you again, but that if she did not allow a third person to join the couple's sex life within a month, there will be issues. Investigator Delp said that when he asked Mackenzie why they chose Stephen to abuse, Mackenzie replied, Because he was the one that was there that day. The next witness was Detective John Gunter, who interviewed McKenzie on January 13th, the day Stephen died from his injuries. Detective Gunter said McKenzie told him he heard the two little boys arguing and physically separated them, admitting that in the process of shoving the boys apart with backhanded blows, he hit his son in the chest, but hit Stephen, who was shorter, hard in the head. He admitted that Stephen fell backwards and hit his head on a dresser, and that when he left the bedroom, he heard Stephen sniffling. Mackenzie told Detective Gunter he was sorry for what he had done and that he'd never hit a child that hard before. The last person on the stand was Assistant Chief Medical Examiner Amy Tharp, who detailed the injuries she found Stephen had suffered. 22 blunt force injuries to the head, 13 more injuries beneath the scalp, 4 injuries inside the mouth, 3 bruises inside the gum line, 10 injuries to the torso, injuries to the right arm and left leg, bruising on the anus and inside the rectum, 
hemorrhaging inside the spinal cord, bilateral retinal hemorrhages, and subdural hemorrhaging. Dr. Tharp was asked if those injuries could have resulted from a fall off a toddler bed, to which she responded, If that kind of height could kill a child, none of us would have survived childhood. According to a later statement by the Commonwealth's attorney, an autopsy was conducted by Dr. Tharp of the medical examiner's office. She noted that Stephen had 22 separate blunt injuries, bruises and scrapes to his head, including pattern injuries to his forehead and back of his head. She found 13 additional injuries on the underside of his scalp. Stephen had 10 external injuries to his torso. In regards to the pattern injuries to both the front and back of his head, Dr. Tharp testified at the preliminary hearing that a pattern injury is when a specific object leaves its imprint on the skin. Dr. Tharp noted that the two separate pattern injuries looked very similar to each other. It is suspected that the pattern injuries were shoe prints. The defendant's shoes were analyzed by the lab. Due to the insufficient detail present, the impression marks on Stephen's head could not be associated with or excluded from the pattern on the defendant's shoes. As for the internal examination of Stephen's head, Dr. Tharp testified that the bruises underneath the scalp indicate the significant impact for a bruise to go all the way through. Stephen had significant bleeding around his brain. When born, our skulls are several bones that are not attached. They are connected by soft tissue. As a baby grows, the bones close together to form a solid skull. In Stephen's case, the bleeding around his brain and the pressure was so significant that it popped those bones back open. Dr. Tharp determined that Stephen's death was caused by blunt force injuries to the head. Judge Robert Weyer certified Mackenzie's remaining charges and sent them on to the grand jury. In January of 2020, Mackenzie Hellman was indicted on all six charges. Both defense attorney Fred Kellerman and Chief Deputy Commonwealth's attorney Patrick Jensen opted for a jury trial over a bench trial, and Mackenzie's trial was scheduled for June of 2020 in Montgomery County Circuit Court. However, due to emergency orders issued by the Supreme Court of Virginia related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the trial was pushed back by necessity a number of times. While awaiting trial, Mackenzie was still held without bond at West Virginia Regional Jail, where the repulsive beast was listed as being 6 feet 6 inches tall and weighing 295 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. At the time of his arrest, he was still legally married to his son's mother, Cheyenne Hellman, who was understandably quick to move forward with their divorce after Mackenzie's arrest. In August of 2020, evidently taking a page out of her scumbag boyfriend's playbook, Kayla Thomas's attorneys requested an evaluation of her sanity at the time of the offense. This request was made during a hearing that was intended to be a plea hearing, but instead the prosecution pushed for a jury trial, which was granted. Kayla's three-day jury trial was scheduled to begin on January 20, 2021, in Montgomery County Circuit Court, although hers, too, was pushed back a couple of times. While she awaited trial, Kayla was also held at Western Virginia Regional Jail with no bond. And now, a word from today's sponsor. COVID-19 slowed down the court processes all over the country, but at last, in March of 2021, more than two years after Stephen's murder, Mackenzie Hellman's three-day jury trial began for his charges relating to sexual abuse. During the trial, prosecutors showed three videos found on Kayla's phone of the hairy horror, a.k.a. Mackenzie, performing sex acts on and with Stephen. According to testimony and recordings, Mackenzie said his sex life with Kayla involved making her pretend to be 12 or 13 and he admitted to police that he requested Kayla perform additional sex acts on her son to see if he himself would become aroused. He told investigators that seeing the requested acts on video repulsed him, although he did save a screenshot from one of them. On March 15, 2021, 27-year-old Mackenzie Hellman was found guilty of all charges against him except second-degree murder and child abuse or neglect, which would be adjudicated at a separate trial. The jury, which deliberated for just 30 minutes, recommended he be sentenced to two life terms, and his sentencing hearing was scheduled for June 29th. Mackenzie's two-day trial on his remaining charges was scheduled to begin on August 10th. The trial for 27-year-old Kayla Thomas began on June 9, 2021. The month before, prosecutors filed a null pros motion to drop Kayla's charge of child abuse or neglect, meaning they didn't plan to pursue the charge. Her trial would instead focus on her remaining four charges relating to the sexual abuse of her son. 
Although her trial was scheduled to last three days, it actually took only one. Kayla pleaded not guilty to charges of inanimate object sexual penetration, forcible sodomy, making child pornography, and distribution of child pornography. According to Kayla's defense attorney, Andrew Harmon, Kayla committed the acts of which she was accused, but she was forced into them by her boyfriend. The prosecution told the court that Mackenzie requested Kayla commit sexual assault on her own toddler, and she complied, making five videos of the abuse, each 30 seconds in duration, and sending them to her boyfriend, who was, again, at the time, masturbating at the other end of the family's mobile home in Christiansburg. The she-beast took the stand in her own defense, testifying that she did commit the acts, but only because she was terrified of her boyfriend, fearing he would harm her, Stephen, and her then-unborn baby. On the stand, Kayla testified that she and Mackenzie had dated for about two years before moving into the mobile home together, just weeks prior to Stephen's death. Mackenzie's ex-wife and child also lived in the home. This was the first indication we received that Cheyenne Hellman was the couple's roommate. During the weeks they lived together, Kayla told the court, Mackenzie used methamphetamine and his personality changed. He turned into this monster I did not recognize. In fact, she testified, when Mackenzie made the disgusting proposition that she commit sexual acts on her own baby, he was on meth and she was afraid if she didn't comply, he would hurt her and their unborn baby. Kayla told the court that she did not want to sexually assault her son and suggested alternatives to Mackenzie, saying she would do drugs with him or have a threesome with him in Cheyenne. She also solicited nude pictures of a female friend to appease him. The following morning, she testified, I finally, I guess, caved. At that point, she performed three sexual violations on her son and afterward felt disgusted with myself. Join the club, lady. I hope you're ready to be further enraged. Kayla admitted on the stand that she still wrote love letters to Mackenzie as recently as a couple weeks before her trial began. The most recent of the letters were dated May 18th and May 23rd, 2021. What was that about being terrified of him again? The unfortunate jury was forced to watch the videos Kayla made of Stephen's sexual abuse, which Christiansburg police investigator Nathan Delp testified were discovered on Kayla's phone. After a long day of testimony and only about an hour of deliberations, at the end of the day, the jury found Kayla Nicole Thomas guilty on all charges and recommended a sentence of two life terms plus 10 years. Kayla was scheduled to be sentenced on September 23rd. Before his case could reach trial in August, on July 26th, Mackenzie Hellman pleaded guilty to his outstanding charges of second-degree murder and child abuse, thereby avoiding a jury trial. Commonwealth's attorney Mary Pettit said in an email, There is no plea agreement. He pled guilty to both charges, and there is no agreement as to an appropriate sentence. Instead of the trial that had been scheduled for August 10th, Mackenzie's sentencing hearing on both sets of charges took place that day in Montgomery County Circuit Court. As to be expected, Mackenzie further proved himself a remorseless slime bag, showing exactly zero emotion while four members of Stephen's family gave their victim impact statements to the court. Unfortunately, I only have a few words from each, but their love for Stephen was more than evident. Stephen's papa, maternal step-grandfather C.J. Chrisley, struggled to speak through his pain, holding up photos of Stephen as he told the court, I'd like an explanation. I don't know. I miss him. I know he's in the arms of Jesus, and I'll see him again. But the hurt's there. So many things I look forward to teaching him. But we won't get that now. Baby Stephen's father, Stephen Meek Sr., told the court, We all miss him more than words can describe. Stephen's paternal grandmother, Elaine DiGiovanni, said in her statement that her grief and depression over her grandson's death almost destroyed my life. Stephen's maternal grandmother, Melinda Chrisley, said directly to Mackenzie, I hope you get the punishment you deserve. The prosecution called for a heavy sentence. Assistant Commonwealth's attorney Chris Obenshane told the court the defendant stole the life of the little boy, adding that while Mackenzie has had the chance to live his life, because of his actions, Stephen Meek will never have that chance. When Judge Robert Turk asked Mackenzie if he had anything to say before receiving his sentence, the hairy creep shook his head and responded, No. Judge Turk followed the jury's sentencing recommendations, handing down a sentence of two life terms plus 90 additional years in prison. According to 10 News, the breakdown of the sentence is as follows. Five years for possession of child pornography. Ten years for distribution of child pornography. Thirty years for production of child pornography. Five years for child abuse or neglect. Forty years for second-degree murder. 
a mandatory life sentence for sodomy, and a mandatory life sentence for object penetration. Judge Turk added another three years suspended sentence and three years of supervised probation, which would only be relevant if and only if you were ever released. In a statement from her office, Ms. Pettit said, Little Stephen Meek paid the ultimate price for Hellman's evil choices. Hellman has little remorse. Thankfully, he'll spend the rest of his life in prison. Ms. Pettit told the Roanoke Times in an email that it was unlikely Mackenzie would ever be released, but her reading of Virginia law was that he could possibly be considered for geriatric parole when he turned 60, which would be on December 10, 2053. Here's hoping the parole board laughs this twisted ogre out of the room if and when that time ever comes. On Thursday, September 23, 2021, Kayla Nicole Thomas's sentencing hearing was held before Judge Mike Fleener. Several members of Stephen's family again gave victim impact statements. Kayla's mother, Melinda Chrisley, told the court, I cannot wrap my head around it. He was so precious. She was supposed to protect that baby. Stephen's papa, CJ, said at the hearing, It's been horrifying. We will carry this every day for the rest of our lives. Kayla was not raised that way. It's very hard to deal with, still to this day, just trying to figure out how something like that could happen. About love letters Kayla sent to Mackenzie while in prison for her son's sexual abuse, CJ added, To speak to him and to actually want to communicate? It's horrible. CJ, who added that he and Melinda still loved their daughter and prayed for her soul, told the court he last saw Stephen in October of 2018. The family was not able to spend Thanksgiving or Christmas with him that year. He said that when Stephen died, they still had a stack of wrapped presents for him. Melinda, he said, packed them all away unable to bear donating the toys or allowing other children to play with them. Stephen Meek Sr. said at the hearing, I really hope that we can get justice for my son. Kayla also gave a statement, removing her face mask to reveal a tearful face as she offered an apology to Stephen's family. Kayla said, I am deeply, deeply remorseful for what happened. I'd give anything to have my baby boy back. I'd do anything to get a second chance and to do right by my son like I should have done in the first place. When it was his turn to speak, Judge Fleener said, This has been a very disturbing, unsettling, and just awful case for everyone involved, to say the least. He added that evidence against Kayla was overwhelming and clearly proved depraved, unfathomable crimes against her own son. The judge sentenced 28-year-old Kayla Nicole Thomas to two life terms plus 10 additional years in a Virginia Department of Corrections facility. Kayla's life sentences are mandatory punishments for forcible sodomy and inanimate object sexual penetration. She also received five years each for making child pornography and distributing or electronically transmitting child pornography. Both Mackenzie and Kayla await transfer to state prison as of this recording. In mid-2019, Stephen Sr. broke up with his wife, Michelle, and got back together with Mackenzie's ex-wife, Cheyenne. Stephen and Cheyenne are now married and raising their kids together, including their three-year-old son, J.M., Cheyenne's nine-year-old daughter, and E.H., her four-year-old son with Mackenzie. Michelle is now married with a one-year-old daughter of her own. I wish nothing but happiness for all of them. Now, as I like to do at the end of each episode, let's talk about little Stephen for a moment. Baby Stephen's favorite thing in the world was Mickey Mouse. For what should have been his third birthday, on July 14, 2020, his maternal grandparents held a small, Mickey Mouse-themed party in his honor. According to his papa, CJ, Stephen loved the rock band Daughtry and also loved to be around deer, which CJ frequently hunted. Some members of the family called little Stephen Turtle. His papa called him Lil' Bit. Other family members called him Little Man. Stephen was adored by absolutely everyone who encountered him. He was a very well-behaved little boy who loved spending time with his family and learning new things. He likely would have grown up to be an avid hunter and fisherman. During his last visit with his maternal grandparents, Stephen even helped his papa process the meat from a deer. According to his stepmom, Michelle, Stephen was amazing, smart, and very loving. She described Stephen as a bright and beautiful little boy who changed my whole world. She said, He made life so fun and bright. Although she's no longer with baby Stephen's dad, she said that will never change what her stepson meant to her, 
and she carries a Mickey Mouse keychain to remind her of him. I miss everything about you. Your I love yous and Mama look while you grab me by the finger to show me your little play microwave, always saying, press button. I miss absolutely everything about you. Michelle also said, he was comfortable with us. Not a moment went by without him saying, Mama look or Mama watch Mickey. I would have taken a bullet for this child. I wish I could have saved you, baby boy. I hope somehow you knew that this mama loved you and always had your back. I carry your memories with me in my heart, always. I don't know what to make of Kayla Thomas and her actions and choices. I have no doubt she loved her baby. We might never be able to comprehend how it came to be that Kayla placed Mackenzie's desires above her son's trust and safety. Regardless of the specific circumstances that led up to Kayla's decision to rape her own toddler's son, that betrayal can never be taken back. It will undoubtedly haunt her for the rest of her life, and rightfully so. Neither she nor Mackenzie deserve a single moment's peace for the rest of their lives. Their actions were absolutely, utterly reprehensible and unforgivable, and in my opinion, no matter how contrite either of them is or eventually becomes, There is no thought or action on this earth that could redeem them. May their lives in prison be more miserable with every passing minute. My heart goes out to Stephen's adoring family. I can only imagine what they've been through between losing both little Stephen and, essentially, Kayla. And while nothing can bring back their little bit, I hope the knowledge that his abusers will spend the rest of their lives in prison has brought them some sense of peace. Rest well, baby Stephen. You deserved the world. My sources for this episode were 10 News, MyHighPlains.com, News 5, WCYB, WDBJ7, The Southwest Times, The Roanoke Times, The Associated Press, The Bower Funeral Home Website, Facebook, Law and Crime, The Western Virginia Regional Jail Website, The Montgomery Circuit Court Case Portal, The Virginia Judiciary Online Case Information System, and The Virginia Department of Corrections Website. That was a tough one. They're all difficult, but baby Stephen's case is just so egregious and disgusting that it's taken a lot out of me to cover it. Even so, he deserves to be remembered. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.